I'm pleased today that we have Sofia Nani from Conocid in Argentina. And we've really enjoyed the opportunity to have Sofia here. She's on a Fulbright Visiting Scholar Fellowship. Um, and she's with us throughout the semester. And we've already started to talk about ideas for collaboration and uh, a lot of really interesting stuff. So I'll, I'll give you a little bit on Sofia's background. Um, she is currently an early career researcher from the Institute of Regional Ecology, which is a research institute at the National University of Tucumán. Is that how you pronounce it? Tucumán. Yes, in Argentina. Um, during her PhD studies, which she finished in 2016, she explored the consequences of land use change on two different vertebrate groups, birds and mammals, in a watershed in northwest Argentina. As a postdoctoral researcher, she identified and explored reforestation hotspot types in Latin America and the Caribbean. And I recently learned that she had a paper just coming out this year in global environmental change on her work on that. Um, currently, her research interests focus on understanding the links between land use change and human wildlife interactions and conflicts in subtropical Argentina. And she's going to talk to you today about a project she's leading in the Chaco region, again, kind of integrating her focus on land use change in relation to human wildlife interactions, which is a perfect fit for our seminar series on human wildlife interactions. <laughs> so with that, I'll turn it over to Sophia. OK, thanks. Thanks for being here, and thank you, Tara, for the presentation. Um, I'm going to talk to you about a project that I'm carrying out in the Argentine Chaco. But first, I thought that it would also be like insightful to share the ongoing land cover changes in Latin America and use my, my, my study case in the Chaco and also another like little project that I'm collaborating with in the Jungas to try to analyze how those land cover changes might influence certain human wildlife interactions in, in Latin America. So the presentation will be like, this will be like the structure of the presentation. We will first have an overview uh, of the global changes in forest cover that are taking place. And then we will take a look, like a more detailed look at the land cover changes in Latin America, what are the spatial patterns and the drivers of land cover changes in Latin America. And we, uh, we will go to a smaller scale to Northwest Argentina, where these two uh, study cases are located. And uh, one of the cases, like I said, it's uh, about humans and mammals in Argentine dry chaco agro agroecosystems. We are working there trying to uh, analyze how we can increase coexistence there. And another one is a small project that I'm collaborating in of an undergraduate student of Tucumán. And we are, uh, she's um, analyzing the interactions between recreational uses and medium to large mammals activity in a local protected area of, of Tucumán. And with that, I will share with you like a few conclusions I'm coming with so far and, and take home messages. So um, let's take a look at the global land cover changes that are happening recently. This is, um, this is a table from the Forest Resources Assessment of 2015. And it shows that globally, deforestation rates seem to be decreasing and in the last 15 years by even more than 50%, which is a lot. And one question that emerges is, does that mean that forest changes are stabilizing in, like, in the globe? And the answer isn't really straightforward. If we look at the map of the world, we have deforestation areas in red and reforestation areas in green. And we can see that the tropics are largely like dominated by deforestation, but in more temperate and or boreal regions, reforestation is like the main land cover change. And so part of that decreases in the deforestation rates are because reforestation are compensating for deforestation but reforestation is occurring elsewhere than deforestation. So that could have implications for, for the benefits and negative aspects of these two processes. They will also be like segregated in space. And this table also shows the same thing that we observed in the figure, but it, it has some numbers. Uh, in million hectares, we can see natural forest area changes between the 90s and 2015. And we again see that Oh, okay. That <laughs> in South America, deforestation, or in South America, in Africa and Asia, deforestation is that the, do the, the dominant trend, one, while in Europe and in North and Central America, like the, the, the changes are more, are, are less. 
And now, if we take a look more specifically at Latin America, this is a study from 2013 from Aid et al. And it addresses land cover changes in Latin America between 2000 and 2010. And we can see in red the deforestation areas, and in blue the areas where reforestation has been like, documented. And even when we see that the dominant, here we see that the dominant trend is forest loss in Latin America, we can see that reforestation is also like significant in terms of the area it's occupying. And another interesting aspect of this paper is that it shows that deforestation in general tends to occur like at lower elevations when compared to reforestation. Uh, it's like it's very visible that reforestation is tends to occur like at higher elevations. Okay, this is working <laughs> alone. <laughs> but when we uh, analyze the drivers of deforestation in Latin America, this makes sense because um, in co compared, to, compared to Africa or Asia, in Latin America the, the, the main driver of deforestation is the expansion of commercial, agriculture and livestock, while in Africa and Asia we have like a higher proportion of subsistence agriculture as a driver of land cover changes. And there is for, for commercial agriculture and livestock expansion, slope and altitude are like big barriers for it because mechanized agriculture needs like to be practiced in the lowlands. So in certain, in some way that conditions where deforestation is going to occur in Latin America and it explains why it is restricted like to the lowlands. Of course there is still subsistence agriculture and livestock and cattle ranching in Latin America but in terms of the area the biggest driver is commercial agriculture and livestock. And that kind of resembles or is like in accordance with the forest transition model, which is a model proposed by Mother in the 90s based on observations um, of natural cover changes in Scotland early in the 20th cen century. And that model proposes that um, as time or development takes place in, a s in certain regions, there is like a shift from net deforestation to net reforestation and that, that shift is associated to, to modernization and to the fact, for example, that agriculture begins to be carried out in more like suitable lands and areas of subsistence agriculture become like disintensified or sometimes rural migration occurs to the city because the cities grow or, li or, or labor shifts occur, for example, people who used to have cattle or now find jobs like in the nearby villages. And sometimes that spares land where reforestation might take place. So we can see a shift from net deforestation to net reforestation, even when those new forests will be, of course, very different from the original primary forests that once were in, in that region. Okay. And this, this forest transition has been shown to happen in many developed areas and more recently in certain regions of Latin America. But one thing that, that we think this model doesn't really look is that it only focuses on the net changes like deforestation or reforestation. But as I've been saying, when we have, um, I don't see the point, okay, when we have <laughs> certain uh, biophysical barriers, for example, topography uh, or altitude, we can expect that um, we can expect the spatial partitioning of the ecological and socioeconomic processes because intensification and urbanization will tend to occur like in the lowlands while disintensification will tend to occur in the highlands. And therefore this is um, a conceptual scheme from, from one of my from my PhD research. And therefore, rather than talking about forest transition, which focuses on the net changes, we talk about forest redistribution because both deforestation and reforestation can be like simultaneously occurring, but they can be occurring in different landscapes or, or, or situations. And with that, I'm going to move now to Northwest Argentina, the region where the projects that I'm working or on are. are. Uh, Northwest Argentina is a region which has a very steep topographical gradient and therefore we have four main ecoregions. We have dry forests that you can see in brown and as altitude increases those dry forests are replaced by, by more humid ecosystems which are the jungas, the, the south, the continuation of the Andean forests. And then we go up in altitude and those jungas become the Andes and the Puna at very uh, at in the highlands like above two miles of elevation 
And between the Andes and the, and the Jungas, we have dry valleys, which are more arid. And Northwest Argentina has been undergoing some of the processes that I've been telling you about. Oh, this is um, a satellite image of how the region is there. That city is Tucumán, where I, where I live. And we can see that the lowlands have been like almost completely replaced by agriculture. And then we can see the Jungas, the, the greener, like more humid systems. And the region has been undergoing those socioeconomic changes that I, I talked about. Um, this is urbanization between the 70s and 2000. And we can see that urban population has increased in all the ecoregion while rural population has either like remained stable or slightly decreased. And when it comes to agriculture and, and commercial livestock, we can see the pattern that I've been talking about as well, because most agriculture uh, expansion focus almost ex exclusively on the dry forests, while in the other ecoregions it is decreasing. And the same happens with livestock. We have increases in cattle and in goats, especially in the dry forests, while in the other ecoregions, livestock is decreasing. So the region has been undergoing like a, a trend of modernization and increasing like more intensive land uses. And the first project that I'm going to talk to you about focuses on, on one of those highly modified systems in the Chaco ecoregion. And it's called Challenges for Coexistence, Humans and Mammals in Argentine Dry Chaco Agroecosystems. This project, we started it around two years ago, and now we are, we are still we are working on it. Um, a little about the Chaco. Uh, the South American Chaco is the largest continuous dry forest of the world. We can see that it extends in portions of Argentina, Bolivia, and Paraguay. And it is today a global deforestation hotspot, mostly for the expansion of soybean and of pasture and seed pasture lands. And between the 80s and today, more than 20% of the natural area has been transformed in the area. And a few days ago, I found this, this note in The Guardian. And this fragment says uh, that uh, the Gran Chaco is a very large and very va valuable place, but it hasn't really received like, the attention it deserves. And in this note, they, they say that's because it isn't like a, as exuberant and humid or like tropical like the Amazon, for example. It's more like a moisac of woody and savanna ecotones with dry forests, so maybe it isn't like so appealing. But the region has huge conservation and cultural importance. It's home to hundreds of indigenous and criollos communities. Though that picture there uh, is for, from a um, witchy community, which, who are the main indigenous community in the Argentine portion. And then we have the criollos, or the campesinos, who are mestizos after the colonization, the Spanish colonization. And they live either in isolated households within the forest, but also in villages where, are, where there are schools and a lot of population who depends on these, on these systems. And there is also high uh, biodiversity. Those are, some, those are some numbers of plant richness. And among vertebrates, for example, almost all, uh, almost a, a huge percentage is under threat because of the ongoing land cover changes. Um, for example, among medium to large mammals, we have the giant armadillo, which is vulnerable according to the IUCN. We have the giant anteater or the jaguar, who, which is, has gone ecologically extinct in the Argentine portion of the Chaco. There aren't more than 20 jaguars. Mm -hmm. That's the, those are the estimations today. And we have also the Chaco Ampecari, for example, which is an endangered species, and it's also an endemic species of the Chaco. And there are still um, extensive large amounts of forests that provide a lot of contrib na nature contributions to the people, especially to the people who live there, but also to all of us. And um, this is an image of the recent land cover changes between 2000 and 2018 <coughs> in the Chaco, in the, both in the Paraguayan, Argentine, and Bolivian Chaco. And we can see that it is widespread, uh, especially in Paraguay and, Ar and Argentina, because Bolivia has more protected areas, and it also has more slopes, and it's less like suitable for agriculture. And those changes are expected to continue, because even when there is a forest law, it allows 25% of the remaining area to be transformed because there are huge like economic interests uh, around deforestation. So these agroecosystems agro and human modified landscapes will become increasingly common in the future. 
And a little about the drivers of land use change. The main driver of deforestation in, in the Chaco is the rising global demand of soybean due to increasing meat consumption. The soybean is exported and it's used to feed the cattle, the livestock, especially in Asia. We can see the here a, a graph showing soybean exports in South America and how they increased from the 90s to 2005. But also there's been like another more regional predisposing factors such as regional increases in rainfall that allowed uh, areas that were, that were unsuitable like for agriculture to become suitable. And also improving technology which increased yields and instead of sparing land for nature, those yields really derived in more deforestation because those areas were now accessible and available for, for more deforestation to take place. And this is how these land systems look like. In a gradient of intensity, we have agriculture and pasture lands. And then we have civil pastoral systems. These systems are now very promoted in the region uh, because they are assumed to be like more, more friendly with biodiversity, even when that doesn't really, hasn't been like empirically tested, but they are becoming like frequent. And then we have the puestos, which are the areas the areas where the criollos live, they usually live inside the forest and have their own cattle uh, and goats. And we have the remaining natural forests which are degraded to different extents because of a long history of uses, of human uses there. Um, and we have also the natural extensive forests where the indigenous communities live. And about people and wildlife, especially criollos and witches have a very strong and long-standing relation with nature and with local wildlife, but that relation is very different among these two social groups because um, witches originally had different religions and beliefs. They, they had more like animistic uh, perceptions of, of, of animals and they, they believed, for example, that animals had a spirit and like a soul. So in, during their harvesting and their hunting, they tried like to to be, uh, for it to be sustainable, not to like make that spirit mad. Uh, but then after colonization, those religions like became mixed with a uh, Catholic religion, um, but it's still there to a certain point. And which is are like uh, Catholic, they are Spanish descendants. And another important difference is that witches uh, usually don't have livestock. They rely almost exclusively on subsistence hunting while criollos do have livestock and even when they practice subsistence hunting, it's not like an important component of their diets anymore. And a long time ago when it was allowed, uh, hunting for selling the animal skin was also very common. That's a picture from the Chaco in 1914. And now hunting is for the forbidden and it's, there aren't any jaguars in the Argentine Chaco, so this isn't like really happening right now. But hunting is like an important tradition in these in these regions and it's interesting how hunting interacts with these novel land uses and social actors and in our service to the people we find like certain indicators of human human conflicts because criollos for example when we ask them different questions they say that they used to rely more on hunting but now that the forest is gone the the animals are also gone and then the farmers say that criollos get inside their fields to hunt and, they are, and that they kill everything that they run to and that they are depleting the, nat the, the animals there. And in reality, these two processes, habitat loss and overhunting, have been shown to be affecting, for example, the jaguar's populations in the Gran Chaco. And this is likely to be occurring in the case of other species, especially like large <coughs> mammals. So um, in that, <coughs> complex and very dynamic context, we are trying to understand how land cover changes in these agricultural frontiers might be affecting human wildlife interactions. And we want to do that because in the Chaco, the, the protected areas are very scarce. For example, the, in the Argentine Chaco, less than 7% of the area is under protection. So we think that uh, the persistence of, of certain species will only be possible if they are able to survive or to persist in those human modified landscapes. Uh, so our main goal is to try to contribute to, inhe to increasing coexistence in these agroecosystems. Um, for that, we first 
we are now trying to understand and characterize the attitudes and behaviors of these different social actors towards wildlife and to which point conflicts are a driver of those attitudes. And then um, in the next slides, I'm going to focus spe specifically on this, but the broader project, we, in the broader project, we are also trying to understand the links between land use changes and the responses of wildlife more from an ecological point of view and how that might relate to human wildlife interactions. And we also expect to, to try to develop with the local social actors uh, management recommendation and strategies to try to improve coexistence in this in this region. So um, a little about the sampling design and methods. This is the Argentine Chaco, and these are the we we have worked already on six agroecosystems. Uh, we we define each agroecosystem as it's an area of around 100 to 200 square miles which is dominated by the agricultural pasture lands, which usually co-occur. And this is one example of, of a site in Salta. And within each site, we do two things. We establish camera traps. Each yellow point is a camera trap station. And to analyze like the ecological changes derived of land use change. And we also perform semi-structure service to the social actors, who in the region are the criollos, the farmers, and also the farm employees who we consider like as a different social actor because they live inside the farms but they have their own um, livestock so it's like an intermediate situation uh, for example these are in red you can see the limits of a farm and these degraded spots inside the forests are the puestos where the criollos or campesinos live so typically at each agroecosystem we have around three or four farms and around 20 puestos or so but it depends uh, but these aren't like very high densely populated regions. And I will now show you the results regarding the attitudes and behaviors towards the puma, wi who is, which is the, the remaining top predator in the area now that the jaguar is ecologically extinct. And this is um, a paper I'm trying to work in during my stay here. So, so far we have 62 interviews of these social groups that I told you about. And this is the distribution of livestock among the interviewees, and we can see that most of them have cattle and also poultry, and the majority of them have two types of livestock and more, or more, and goats are also like frequent among the people. And one of the questions that we asked was what were, what were the main causes of livestock loss? And we can see that around 50%, 40% of the people said that depredation was uh, the main cause of livestock loss, followed by illness, drought, and road accidents. Um, and then we asked also a question to address their attitudes towards the puma. We asked them how much they agreed with the fact with with the fact that they would be better if the puma wasn't in the area. How strongly they agreed to that statement. And we found that negative and very negative answers in more than 80% of the interviewees, so that reveals like an intolerance of the different social actors towards the species. And that intolerance didn't really differ among social actors. It was like very generalized. Oh, okay. And, okay, this is, <laughs> this is like a life. <laughs> um, and then, okay. <laughs> uh, another thing that we addressed was, was livestock predation by the puma among the different social actors, the criollos, the farm employees, and the, and the farmers. And we saw that even when, when a higher percentage of criollos reported livestock depredation in the last year, that, that difference wasn't really significant, and, and all social actors had livestock predation to a certain point. And and uh, we found the same pattern when it came to retaliatory behaviors, to whether they had killed the puma in the last year. We found that all social actors, even uh, although it is a low percentage, but all of them uh, had killed a puma in the last year, and the difference didn't really vary among social actors. But we found that livestock predation seemed to be dri driving retaliatory behaviors because when people tended to undergo livestock predation, they reported to be more engaged in, ki in puma killing in the last year, 
when when they didn't experience lives of predation, they didn't kill the puma either. Um, and that difference was significant. And then also we <coughs> tried to explore if certain uh, managements or types of livestock were like more vulnerable to puma predation. And also we explored if the, if the reported abundance of the puma was a factor explaining or influencing livestock predation. And this is, these are the results of a logistic regression that we did for that. And we see that when they don't use fences, the likelihood of undergoing livestock predation increased. And it also increased when they, have, when they had goats and sheep. And it decreased when they reported that the puma was rare in the area, which is interesting because it might be linking predation with may maybe changes in natural area that might be leading to a decreasing puma density in the area. And this is just the graphic illustration of this. We see that there's a higher percentage of people reporting predation when they use fences, but a higher percentage reports predation when they have goats and sheep. And it's also uh, higher when they, th when they report the puma to be common or very common. So, so far we have some conclusions that we are coming with. First, uh, we think we can say that there is a generalized like intolerance for the puma in this in the in the agroecosystems that we studied, and that intolerance doesn't seem to be driven like by reported predation. So we think that maybe psychological drivers of tolerance might be playing a role because this intolerance isn't like a consequence of conflict, but it's more like generalized and widespread. But Retaliatory behaviors do seem to be driven by reported livestock predation, with, which suggests that maybe improving certain management strategies could lead to reducing livestock predation and therefore maybe reducing retaliatory killing. And we also think that the strategies to try to work on tolerance should be different among social groups because, for example, based on the results of the probabilities of undergoing predation under different management types, criollos who usually don't have fences and who have goats and sheep would be like more expo exposed to undergoing predation by the puma. And these are usually like the more, the poorer criollos because there are a lot of criollos who have ca ca cattle and who use fences. So maybe like improving management for those people who could reduce this livestock predation. And we also observed in the, in the field that some people had uh, or said they had like 50 goats killed in, in a winter or maybe th or more than 30, which are like very large numbers and which have a, a great impact on their economies and subsistence. But in the case of farmers, the situation is different because farmers were still intolerant to the puma, even when they have um, thousands of cows, they, are, they have fences and they usually don't undergo livestock predation or if they do, that isn't like very relevant to their economies but they still were said that they, they would prefer that the puma wasn't there. So maybe for these farmers working like on, 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 communication, on communication messages of the benefits associated to the presence of the puma could be like a good approach to try to increase tolerance. And another thing that we think is important is that in the Chaco specifically, it is usually assumed that uh, the changes in natural area will be the main drivers of the changes in biodiversity. And we think that conservation strategies should also address like the social suitability of these landscapes, especially for species like the puma, who, which aren't really so dependent, so dependent of intact natural areas. They can live in human modified landscapes to a certain extent. And at least for the puma, we are seeing that the tolerance seems to be low. So conservation strategies based only of na on natural habitats wouldn't be enough like for this species and very likely for other species that interact with the people there. And now we're going to another different place um, to show you, yeah. Just on, the, on your prior presentation before you move on from that, can I ask a, a question? About yes, of course. I think it, it said of the animals that were lost, 39% were from predation, was what people reported. It was, uh, yeah, it was actually 39 of the people reporting 
uh, depredation as the main cause of livestock loss. Did, in there, did they give an estimate of how many of their, what percent of their animal or their herd? Yes, yes, in, in general. You may have said it, what is that? We, no, I didn't say it because it's, it's like not all of them say it. It's something that we don't ask directly because they are not always wanting to share that information, but sometimes it, it comes up in the conversation. And it, it was very high, the number, when they were goats. It's like, and it's this, there's this, I don't remember the name for when this behavior, when the puma kills a lot of su surplus killing. Yeah. So it's like uh, the puma, they, they seem to, to think that the puma goes and kills more animals, not to eat them, but just because they are there. And that, I think that's called surplus killing. So in certain cases, they said that 30 goats, that the puma killed 30 goats, like in a week, for example. Yeah. But when it was cattle, they were usually like the, the small cattle, the, the young cattle. I don't know, remember Cain. the name? Yeah, the calves. 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 And it was usually one, yeah, and it wasn't. But when there were goats and, and sheep, the number was higher. And so would one goat be out of five goats? Do you see what I'm asking? Oh, yeah, the number. They usually have maybe 80. 80? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it's an important like percentage for their livelihood. One would be bad enough for 30. Would yeah. Be <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <It's> okay. <laughs> um, this is a very uh, this is a, a, a small project of an undergraduate student, but I wanted to share with you to share it with you just an, an example of another like emergent interaction derived of those land use changes that are occurring <coughs> in Latin America, and it's called interactions between recreational uses and medium to large mammals presence in tracts of a local protected area in northwest Argentina. Um, just a little of background, the Jungas ecoregion in Argentina is only 100 miles from the Chaco that I was talking about, but it's a completely different system. It occupies only 2% of the country, but it harbors half the biodiversity of Argentina because it's mostly humid, very diverse forests. And it has a strong uh, altitudinal gradient as well, and it has large and expanding ur urban settlements like in the near the foothills. And in the region, like I talked about, uh, about Northwest Argentina, subsistence activities are decreasing. And other uses of land, especially the expansion of suburbs and recreational uses are increasing. So the research question she is working on is exploring the interactions between recreational uses in the trails, uh, of in the peri-urban trails, and medium to large mammal presence and activity and also exploring if, if wildlife is a motivation for people to engage in these activities. Um, this is the location of the study area. This is Tucumán, again, and this is the protected area. And here is the, the laboratory the, the where I come from. And this project actually started because just out of curiosity, we put a camera trap like it's right behind our lab to, to see what, what happened. And we wasn't expecting like many species to to be there. But then after 20 days, we found that there were actually a lot of species um, of, of mammals. May, many of them were even like vulnerable, vulnerable species. So then we started like to think what these recreational activities, how these recreational activities might affect them. And a little about the changes in the study area. This is a study that reports urbanization processes and a peri-urban forest transition taking place in the region. We can see this is the change in the city between the 70s and 2010. And we can see how the, the city expanded like three times or maybe more, especially like near the, these, these low areas. And also these grasslands decreased and were replaced by forests, which is why they, they found like a forest transition going here. And when it comes to the recreational uses, this doesn't really, uh, this, these are like certain trails of this, of this natural area. And there are a lot of visitors annually and even up to 3,000 people per day on the weekends in these trails. And that number is increasing 
And a study shows that visits have increased more than 10 times in the last years. So it's like they are, they practice mountain bike, trail running, a lot of activities, and it's only like 10 minutes away from the city. So it's, it's very close and accessible. But uh, uh, the wildlife, um, we have this large uh, mammals are mostly gone from this system. They, they've been gone for a, for a long time, the top predators and also the large herbivores, uh, because uh, subsistence activities were also very frequent and there are, there are like high population densities here. But we have around 12 to 15 na native mammal species. And we see in the camera traps a lot of uh, dogs that seem to be like uh, wild. They are now, they are like in groups and they are becoming, we see them in the cameras a lot, like in groups. So we, we think they have become like wild now, which is also so interesting because that can imply like disease transmission and other things. And these results are just very simple, but what we are seeing, this is the comparison of species richness between a control site, which is not used as a trail, and two trails that are very, very used. And these are, sorry, these are two distances. One, one camera is placed like very near the trail, and the other is placed like a quarter mile away from the trail. And we can see that the species presence of medium to large mammals is, highly, is higher in the control site compared to these two distances of these two trails. And the same happens with the frequency of activity of mammals. We have less number of records in the trails compared to the control sites. So we can see that there seems to be an effect of recreational uses on, this, on, the, on, the, on these species. And regarding the people's motivation to visit trails, I don't have uh, any graphics of, of this yet, but we are seeing that the, the reasons they mentioned the most are practicing sports in a natural environment, relaxing, or the sensations derived of being close to nature, or even the like visual, um, visual aspect of nature. But they, people don't usually mention wildlife as one of the motivations to engage in these activities. And when we ask them whether they know about the species present in the region, we see that there's little awareness of the, peop of the species that are present in the region and even little knowledge of, of the fact that certain species are there. She shows them, this student shows them picture of the animals and asks them if, if they recognize them, and most of them don't at all. <laughs> um, so based on those two projects, certain conclusions and take home messages that I think can be interesting is that the drivers of land use changes in Latin America are relatively predictive, uh, de um, derived to changes to be so somewhat predictable in this region. For example, it is expected that deforestation will continue in the lowlands, and it is also expected that recreational uses continue to increase. So maybe, even when that has a lot of negative aspects and consequences, it can also provide a window of opportunity to try to anticipate to certain expected changes in human wildlife interactions and to try to carry out like proactive approaches to improve coexistence. And based on the examples that I told you, for example, in the Argentine Chaco, I think that we should focus, we should further focus on increasing tolerance and social habitat suitability. And it might be as important as addressing the consequences of land use changes. And I wanted to share with you this like positive news regarding the Jaguar. There's, there's been this, these two agencies have been working on, on the Jaguar for years, for more than 15 years. And for more than 10 years, they didn't even re register one Jaguar in the camera traps with a lot of camera trap effort. And with the establishment of new protected areas and with the hard work with the local communities trying to like focus on the positive aspects of the presence of the jaguar, especially this year and the last year, there have been more records of jaguars and they have been, been able to even put a, a radio collar in one. So now they are like monitoring where the jaguar moves. So it is likely that the, the jaguar begins to recolonize the Argentine Chaco or it can occur. So maybe like working from now on increasing tolerance for this and other species could be like a way to to be more successful if the jaguar returns to the Argentine Chaco. And also, large landowners and farmers are novel social actors, and they 
play an important role because they have large amounts of land and their decisions impact on large amounts of land. People usually focus on the criollos and campesinos. They say that campesinos are the ones who hunt, are the ones involved like in human-wildlife interactions. But these farmers also are engaged in these interactions and they should be also targeted. And when it comes to uh, systems like the peri-urban jungas or the peri-urban natural areas, other land uses seem to be decreasing in the region and some people say that this wildlife that is gone, like the top predators, might be coming back. So recreational uses could be jeopardizing that recolonization or if that recolonization takes place, it could become a conflict between recreational uses and the, and the presence of the species. And at the same time, in, in these local protected areas, the trails are established like very opportunistically without any like design at all. So these interactions between recreational uses and wildlife presence might be important to take into account when thinking where to establish these new trails and regulating like recreational uses. And also increasing recreation is, is or could be an opportunity like to, to carry out participatory and educational activities to try to generate more awareness and knowledge of the local wildlife by these people who, who go to the trails. And so that would be like a good opportunity. And with that, that's all I have today. And I'm <laughs> open to any questions you might have. Questions about how actively recreation is managed. Are they trails that develop on their own? Are there are there, are there trails that some agency goes out and builds the trails and maintains the trails? And then, in addition, does there do these agencies, if they are any, have control over the number of people that go? So there is like this is a nation this is a protected area and there are there is like an a, a regulation agency but it, it 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 functions very badly so the trails are like I would say spontaneously open and once they are open because people go through the trails then they become to be managed but in a very like in, informal way so the control is there is one trail where the, uh, uh, local local people are like managing those that trail, so that people is you have to pay now to get to go in that in that trail, but it's absolutely informal because that's not regulated at all. That people like took the opportunity to to for people to pay them to use the trail, and they have a control of the number of people. So when we asked, we go stra we went straight to them to ask them how ma many people like were in the trail. But it's like very poorly regulated. So the groups that manage are they like local? Are they governmental groups or are they non-governmental? They are governmental, but it's like it's unexistent really. So the the manage the actual manage is carried out by the local people that live there and there and that took the opportunity like to for for a, for a salary and for 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 being paid for managing that trail but it's very informal and even like illegal probably but it's how it's working <laughs> now <laughs> um if you guys are finding that fences help as far as protection um why aren't more farmers using it and does anyone know like is that messing up habitat connectivity for all of the other wildlife or is it already such a human modified landscape that it doesn't matter Yes, um, they aren't using it because they have usually very uh, few resources, both um, like practical resources. They, 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 have, they haven't really these criollos. Some of them, especially the ones who have goats and, and sheep, they are very poor and living under very like uh, poor conditions. So they, sometimes they have the, the fences, but they don't just don't like put the animals inside. And they have sometimes so, so many animals that they lose like control of the goats, mm -hmm. for example, because they are usually also um, getting old, like people are aging in these systems because the young people are like moving to the villages. So it's like more a lack of resources and of control. And yes, it is an interfering with the connectivity 
in the landscape. There are a lot of also conflicts on land tenure because the land tenure of these criollos is usually like uh, not with the papers and all, so there are a lot of conflicts in that sense as well. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I, I think a couple questions about um, the, the, the depredation. Um, first was more methodological, um, and I'm wondering if, if I'm understanding that, that you were measuring depredation based on just reports from farmers, and if if you dealt with um, possible biases in, in, in questioning. Um, that's not criticism. Like I, I, I no, it. yeah. it's challenging. But then the second question was that. Well, maybe more substantive, if, if, if you think there's potential or if you observe any institutions or cooperative efforts among farmers or livestock keepers to mitigate or avoid depredation events like shared herding responsibilities or pooled effort in building fences or, or building more secure livestock enclosures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so about the first question, it's, it, it can definitely be happening. It's, we, we, we can't really know to which point those, those numbers are accurate or not, but we think that even if that's the perception or, or, or if that's what they are saying about it, that's meaningful either way because it's how they are, it's like their perception and dimension of the problem. So we, we are trying to think how to, to like account for that bias. And we try to develop, like, because this is taking place also in the context of camera trapping, and they are usually involved in that, and we have, like, workshops to tell them about it. We try, like, to build trust and all to, for them to, like, be open about it, but it's, it's possible, absolutely. But we think that for the purpose of this project, which is more focused on attitudes, even if it isn't, like, real depredation, it's still meaningful because it's what, how they are, like, picturing it. And about the, th the second thing, um, there aren't really any like cooperative efforts. There are cooperative efforts when hunting the puma. It's like when, for example, if a neighbor, <laughs> if a neighbor hunts, uh, has gone, go, well, goes on, on livestock predation, then the whole like Criollo community go all the night until they find the puma, and you never know if it's the same puma or other one, but they end up <laughs> finding one, and they they are like. Um, they dedicate time to that. We found that it was also like an activity, even even like a tradition. They they like get together to to do that, but not really to to develop fences. No, the farmers they have like very good fences and all, but it's like individual. Yeah. Are they active managers of their livestock? Do they take them where they want them to go? Do they are they active in? protection of the wildlife, of the, of the livestock while they're out, or are they more passive managers? Some of them are. It's the, the, there are some criollos who even sell livestock and, have, and they have like more resources and they are more active and more engaged in that, but um, mo many of them aren't. And we think that the fact that there's like also aging in this population, mm -hmm. it's like they are, sometimes they are old people and they can't really, they don't have like the energy or, so many of them aren't like very active. And some of them even say that they lost 10 goats and they don't know if it's the puma or it's that they got lost. It's like they don't have that control on, on their livestock. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have a question about tolerance. Um, I know the focus here was on Puma, um, but did you also look at Jaguar tolerance among people? I was just curious, given that the Jaguar is moving back in, whether it's perceived in the same way that the Puma is. We didn't specifically look at Jaguars, because, but it was, it, it, it was very frequently mentioned, and they it seems to be also like like negative. They have like these ideas that, for example, they usually say that the grandfather, the jaguar once killed all their goats and all that. Mm -hmm. And other studies of jaguars in the Chaco show that the tolerance is also like, like very low. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> It's okay. Can I ask a, a follow-up question? Um, when when you said that the 
if there's a prediction event that a single family might kind of rally the community or the small settlement around them to go off and find a predator. Are, is that almost always the response to a predation event? Or sometimes might there not be a retaliatory killing? Um, and, and if that's the case, do you know what separates um, the responses from retaliatory killing mm -hmm. and, and tolerance? That's a good question. And we, we are like seeing that it's, it kind of depends on the area. There are areas that we, we haven't really like quantified, but that seem to, to have like more predation of livestock. And in those areas, in two sites in particular, it's like that the, this behavior of, of going together to hunt the puma is very frequent. And then in other areas where livestock predation isn't as frequent, the people just say they don't go and hunt the, the puma because it's too time consuming and they usually don't find it and it's not like very easy to find it and they don't engage in that effort. So it's like, seems to be like site dependent, at least from what we are seeing. But not, not really all the people, but based on our analysis, it's like around half of the people who undergo predation engage in, in retaliatory killing. So many of them also don't. I just have a quick question about the lack of um, ability for the recreational users to identify the animals. I think that's really interesting. In typically, I mean, obviously education, formal education may play a part in that, but typically that would then, do, or does that indicate then that those people are coming from urban environments out? Mm -hmm. So they just have had no like exposure in their life. Yeah, I think it's related to, these people are usually like educated people, like... Um, For, like formal education. Yeah, and, and they, um, we were very surprised because they, they were like absolutely surprised with some of the pictures that the students showed, us, showed them. So uh, we think it's because they are coming from the urban environment and it is because like the education, the formal education is, isn't like including these these things in the natural like, science. yeah natural science isn't I I know because when when I studied we didn't I also didn't know like about these species so yes and at the same time the trails are a good place like to put signs and information like sure. letters about the species and since the management is like very bad there that doesn't happen either we are trying like the, this student wants to try to carry out some uh, developing signs and that but it's it's not like happening. In it would also be interesting to know if any of these recreational users are having wildlife interactions. Mm -hmm. or, you know, it sounds like a lot of them are using it for sports, as you said, like running or walking. Yeah, so maybe just sports. that alone is kind of keeping. Yes, and even sometimes mm -hmm. when they, they were like not very happy when we saw the pictures, they were like, I can find this here, and they didn't like the yeah. idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, yeah. <laughs> But equally, that kind of social behavior can be flipped, right? Where depending on the, the motivation behind using the natural area, wildlife viewing could be an impetus. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like that's not the situation in that area. No, it doesn't seem that to be, so yes. That's kind of interesting, yeah. Mm -hmm. The possibility for education is there. Yeah, it's, there's a big, that we, are, we are seeing that there's a big possibility and an even need of like education and more awareness of the species here. But I'm even thinking in the tracking skills of the groups that are going out to hunt the puma. You've seen in so many other case studies around the world where that type of skill set, community skill set, can be um, mobilized for viewing. So, right, tourists can pay like lots of money because they want to see a puma. Mm -hmm. So exactly. instead of hunting it, they're getting tons of money, and that could compensate for the the financial loss of the livestock or whatever. You know, so that linkage mm -hmm. of kind of like flipping the desire and knowledge of the recreational users, and there's a difference obviously between the recreation component and the tourism component, mm -hmm. right? If you're going out running at night or whatever. Yeah. You don't want to see a puma. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if you're on holiday or coming from the city and then you want to have a wildlife experience, then that could be a financial compensation mechanism for, because the skill set is there to find the animal, mm -hmm. yeah, to track yeah. it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's pretty interesting. Is there any kind of like buffer zone between where the park starts and the city? Like, is there like any in between or is it just like, trails literally in the protected area and then like streets. 
like is there a buffer zone? There is, there is a little like a maybe half mile buffer zone or so with the, that is composed mostly by by lemon plantations and other kind of citrical plantations. Is that used for recreation at all or is it just that protected? It is used as well, yes, mostly for mountain bikes, yes. Mm. And there and wildlife uses we we put cameras there and they wildlife also uses it. Yeah. Okay. Sophia, thank you again. Thank you very much. And just as a quick heads up, our next uh, seminar is actually next Wednesday, same time, same room. And it will be Peter David from the Great Lakes Indian Wildlife Commission. Um, so join us then if you're available. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.